Hello, I'm Sheldon Axler, the author of Linear Algebra Done Right. This video discusses part one of the section of the book titled Generalized Eigenvectors and Nilpotent Operators. In this video, we will focus on null spaces of powers of an operator. Let's review the standard assumptions about notation that we will be using in this section. As usual, f denotes either the scalar field R of real numbers or the scalar field C of complex numbers. Also, we've been talking about inner product spaces, but the material that we're going to be discussing does not really rely upon inner products. Thus, from now on, we're going to assume that V is a finite dimensional non-zero vector space over our scalar field f. In other words, V is no longer necessarily an inner product space. It is finite dimensional, and we've added the assumption that V be non-zero just to avoid some trivial exceptions to some of the results. We are aiming to give a description of a general operator on a complex vector space V. We won't get to that in this video, but we need some preliminary material that will help us. Here's the first result we'll need. Suppose T is an operator on V. Then we have the string of inclusions shown here concerning the null space of powers of t. Let's look at this carefully. It starts with 0 is equal to the null space of t to the 0 power. t to the 0 power, by definition, is the identity operator. And of course, the null space of the identity operator is 0. So that gives us that first equality. The next inclusion says the null space of t to the 0 is contained in the null space of t. And of course, that's true because 0 is contained in every subspace, and in particular, in the null space of t. And then after that, we have uh, inclusions. Specifically, we have that the null space of t to the k is contained in the null space of t to the k plus 1. Here, the word contained in means that they might be equal. Contained in just means that every element of the null space of t to the k is also an element of t to the k plus 1. So that includes the possibility that the two sets are equal. Let's look at the proof of this result, which is quite easy. Suppose k is a non-negative integer and v is in the null space of t to the kth power. That means that t to the k applied to v is 0. That means that t to the k plus 1 applied to v, which is t applied to t to the k of v, is simply t applied to 0. And because t is a operator, in particular t is linear, that says t of 0 is 0. So we conclude that t to the k plus 1 of v is 0, which means v is in the null space of t to the k plus 1. We started with the assumption that v was in the null space of t to the k. We conclude that v is in the null space of t to the k plus 1. That means the null space of t to the k is contained in the null space of t to the k plus 1, which is what we wanted to prove. This completes the proof. Now let's erase that proof so that we have room to display and prove another result. Here's our other result. Suppose t is an operator on v. And suppose that in this chain of inclusions from the first result above, at some point we have an equality, meaning that the null space of t to the m is equal to the null space of t to the m plus 1 for some non-negative integer m. The conclusion is that we have equalities all the way after that also. Let's look at the proof of this result. Let k be a positive integer. We want to prove that t to the m plus k is equal to t to the m plus k plus 1, giving us the equality all the way through. We already know one inclusion from the top result above. Specifically, we already know that the null space of t to the m plus k is contained in the null space of t to the m plus k plus 1. So we need to prove the inclusion in the other direction to get the desired equality. To do that, suppose v is a vector in the null space of t to the m plus k plus 1. Then t to the m plus 1 applied to t to the k of v is equal to t to the m plus k plus 1 applied to v. And that's 0 because v is in the null space of t to the m plus k plus 1. Hence, t to the k of v is an element of the null space of t to the m plus 1. And now we use 
our hypothesis that that null space is equal to the null space of t to the m. Thus, t to the m plus k of v, which is equal to t to the m applied to t to the k of v, is zero. Again, that's because t to the k of v is in the null space of t to the m. This means that v is in the null space of t to the power m plus k. Now we started with the assumption that v was in the null space of t to the m plus k plus 1. We concluded that t is in the null space of t to the m plus k. And thus, this implies that the null space of t to the m plus k plus 1 is a subset of the null space of t to the m plus k. We had already proved the other direction, so this completes the proof of the equality. The result we have just proved shows that if we ever hit an equality in this chain of inequalities about null spaces of powers, then we get equality forever on after that. This raises the natural question of whether we do indeed ever hit an equality. The next result shows that's the case, and that depends upon v being finite dimensional. Here's the result. Suppose t is an operator on v. Let n equal the dimension of v. Then, the null space of t to the n is equal to the null space of t to the n plus 1, and equalities forever on. Let's look at the proof of this result. We only need to prove the first equality, and then by our previous result, we get equalities from then on. Well, suppose this is not true. Suppose we don't have an equality there. Then, at all the previous stages, we have to have strict inequalities. That's what the the contained in but not equal to sign means strict inequalities, because if we, at a previous stage, if we had an equality, then we'd have an equality everywhere past there, and in particular, we'd have an equality in the last inclusion displayed. At each of these strict inclusions in the chain above, the dimension increases by at least one, because we have a strict inequality. But we're in a vector space of dimension n, and if we've increased the dimension by at least 1, n plus 1 times, we've gotten that the dimension of the null space of t to the n plus 1 has to be bigger than or equal to n plus 1. But that's impossible, because the subspace of v, which has dimension n, cannot have a larger dimension than n. This completes the proof. Our last result in this video states the following. Suppose t is an operator on v. Let n equal the dimension of v. Then v is equal to the null space of t to the n, direct sum, the range of t to the n. Before getting to the proof of this theorem, let me say that it's a shame that we don't have a theorem saying that v is equal to the null space of t, direct sum, the range of t. That would make operator theory a lot easier, but unfortunately, it's just not true. Please think of an example yourself, or see the example in the book to show that we really do need to include the n there. Let's look at the proof of this result. First, we want to show that we indeed have a direct sum. That means we need to show that the intersection of these two subspaces is equal to 0. To do that, suppose we have a vector v in the intersection of the two subspaces. That means, in particular, that t to the n of v is 0. That's because v is in the null space of t to the n. And also, because v is in the range of t to the n, there's some vector u in v such that t to the n applied to u is equal to v. Now, apply t to the n to both sides of the equation at the bottom of the first column. And we conclude that t to the 2n of u is equal to t to the n of v. But t to the n of v, as you can see from the first column, is equal to 0. That says that t to the 2n of u is 0. And the result we proved on the previous slide says that the null space of t to the 2n is the same as the null space of t to the n, because we've hit the dimension. And thus, t to the n of u is equal to 0. Thus, v, which is equal to t to the n of u, is 0. In other words, we've shown that our arbitrary vector v in that intersection is 0. So the intersection of those two subspaces is indeed 0. That means we do have a direct sum. 
And now we have to show that the direct sum is the whole vector space V. But let's look at the dimension of that direct sum. The dimension of the direct sum of two subspaces is equal to the sum of the dimensions of the two subspaces, giving us this equation. And now I hope you're thinking what to do. We should use the fundamental theorem of linear algebra to show that the dimension of the null space of any operator plus the dimension of the range of that operator is equal to the dimension of the domain, in this case v. So we have this equation. And now this equation, the dimension of the direct sum is the dimension of the whole space, means that direct sum has to equal the whole space. This completes the proof. This concludes part one of the video on generalized eigenvectors and nilpotent operators. If you see a small picture of a slide in the upper left corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the next video. If you see a small picture of part of the cover of linear algebra done right in the upper right corner of this slide, then you can click on it to get to the book's website.